the elimination stages. Let's head down to our feature match area now for this final round of the Swiss here at Grand Prix Birmingham. Hello and welcome to this round 15, the final round of the Swiss stages of this legacy portion of Grand Prix Birmingham. We have two Grand Prix going on this weekend and our legacy Grand Prix just a single round away from completion before we get to the Swiss stage, before we get to the elimination stages, should I say. And Peter White up against Janis Skobfi Anderson. They are having to play out this uh, final round here in order to determine which of them is going to make it into our top eight. Kicking things off with a Gitaxian probe here from Peter White, seeing Diabolic Edict, a couple of lands there alongside uh, Preordained Colligan's Command, uh, Fatal Push, and a copy of Brainstorm there. Simon Gertsen, you've got the, uh, the full stands in front of us. We know there's already a few players in our top eight. Who can we expect to be seeing during our elimination stages? So the top four seats uh, are all in with the ID that they took. That's uh, Peter van der Ham, Johan de Greuter, Gregor Kowalski, uh, GP champion, and Gary Campbell. And then, surprisingly, table three also ID'd. That's Bernardo Santos and uh, Jucha Ihonen. And uh, if, if you look at these tiebreakers, they have put themselves at risk of um, ending up in ninth place or even ninth and tenth. So their ID is definitely not a safe bet, which is why you see these two players play it out, which is, which is definitely a smart choice. Yeah, X and 2 record very comfortably in the top eight. X and 3, suddenly you're playing a tiebreakers game. And if I'm cho choosing to play a game this weekend, it's going to be Magic the Gathering. <laughs> not tiebreakers. Uh, here we have uh, a brainstorm coming from Peter White, uh, just off a basic island for now. Uh, and brainstorm, one of the key cards in this format, really hoping to, after you've had to put a few cards back on top of your deck, to be able to find a shuffle effect so that those cards that you've put back, you don't have to draw them again, you can just uh, carry on regardless. But it is just an island for Peter White here, so on Miracles, he will be just drawing the same cards again over this next few turns. Thought Seize comes from Yanis here, and potentially it could be that Peter White had hidden a couple of cards here. As things stand, with two islands and clearly on blue-white miracles here with double Monastery Mentor, that may signal a little bit of mana issues for him. Detention Sphere, Force of Will, Jace the Mind Sculptor, and Daze there. No interest in using uh, Force of Will on this Thought Seize, I guess because the blue cards in his hand, he didn't want to have to go that far down on cards. No, but... Also, I'm now really, really uh, interested in what is what is on top of his deck. If he doesn't have a white source there, then he, he brainstorm locked himself out of the game. He's not going to cast a spell for the next few turns, and that is probably going to be fatal against uh, the Grixis deck of uh, Anderson. Anderson doesn't even know what to take, because uh, this is not really a scary hand, even though the cards are individually powerful. Takes probably the most individually powerful card in that hand in Jace the Mind Sculptor, and there is a counterbalance on top of Peter White's deck. Now this is not quite a completely uh, naked counterbalance, if you will. Peter does know what the top card of his deck is, and he reveals a path to exile on the top of his deck. That's not going to help him cast any more spells, but at least it meant that he was able to counter a preordain on the other side of things. And he kind of just leaves it face up there for a minute, just in case uh, Yanis had any intention of casting more one drops. Mm, uh, funnily enough, Anderson knew that if there was a spell, a one-mana spell on White's deck, then at least he wouldn't draw a land. So he was getting he was getting a good outcome either way. As things stand, for Peter White, a main deck back to basics <coughs> that he's drawn there. Another card he's unable to cast, stuck on just two copies of Basic Island. This is not where the Miracles player wants to be. Miracles is a deck that I consider to be kind of a late-game control deck. And right now, it even getting to the late game may be a little bit of a challenge here. No, this um, this seems really disastrous. I understand that Gitaxian Probe, uh, followed by Brainstorm, do give you a good shot, but the, the problem with Brainstorm is the earlier you cast it, the more likely it is that you don't find lands, and then your game is basically over. So uh, actually, this would have been a really good example of exercising some patience and just saying, look, I will, I will sit here until maybe I'm forced to discard or until things get really w uh, bad for me. I even have Force of Will, so I'm not under real pressure. In fact, uh, this is not a matchup uh, where Tempo plays such a huge role. And instead, White fired off the Brainstorm, failed to fight lands, and now uh, he's just sitting there with effectively nothing in play. 
And I guess that another option potentially available to him was casting counterbalance with a brainstorm in hand so that if a big spell got cast, he had the opportunity to put the appropriate thing on top of his deck in response to the counterbalance trigger. Yeah, another, uh, another argument for that, uh, for being a bit more patient. And I guess that he was able to hide his counterbalance with uh, Brainstorm there, but I, I don't know whether or not he could reasonably have expected to, uh, to see Thought Seize when he did. No, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really wondering if, if Peter White's keep uh, was warranted or if, if it was just a little bit too optimistic. Force of will there on him to Turak, uh, having to protect his hand where he can, but not too much that can be done here about Liliana or the Last Hope with just an island on top of the deck. At least that island means that he'll be up to three mana, but it's three mana that is all islands. It means his Back to Basics is looking pretty good, but uh, I don't know if Back to Basics on its own is going to be enough to get him back in this game, given there's Force of Wills on both sides of things here to force down Liliana. I think Back to Basics might be the card that could get him back into this game. If then he manages to prevent uh, Liliana from doing anything too scary, uh, like ultimating, we might have a game here. Throws down that back to basics. Back to basics, a very potent card indeed. Non-basic lands do not untap, and there are quite a lot of non-basic lands available in a lot of legacy lists. Unusual in some respects that there's already a swamp in play for Yanis, and the fact that he's got two copies of Polluted Delta means that if he's got basics to fetch, he should be able to find them without too much trouble here. Yes, but the, the cost is still quite high. Another one of these uh, Urza Saga cards that are just uh, potentially super powerful. Of course, in some, in some formats or in some games, it has almost no impact, but when it does, it's, it's a super strong card. Yeah, when you look back to the earlier days of the game, there are certainly some very powerful, indeed, ways of dealing with particular colors, particular card types, in this case, uh, non-basic lands. Um, that we, you don't really see printed anything quite that egregiously powerful to stop a particular strategy these days. Okay. Uh, Anderson announced his him to Tarek and they were already resolving it before, uh, before we saw it. But and with three cards happened. in hand, essentially they were rolling a die to figure out which card would be kept rather than the one that would be discarded just for efficiency's sake. Both Monastery Mentors hit the bin there, by the way. That does now mean that uh, Yanis knows nothing about what's going on in uh, Peter White's hand. Another Monastery Mentor on the top of the deck there revealed to counterbalance. So in principle, Peter could elect to shuffle it away with his Scalding Tarn. But given that he's almost certainly fetching a, uh, a land that can help him cast that Monastery Mentor, I kind of like keeping it on top. Though he's going to have to fetch a, uh, a Tundra here, which will... Uh, remain tapped. Yeah, planes would be a lot better, but uh, you can't get that with Scalding Tarn. And uh, I think Anderson is just going to punish that mentor with um, with the fatal push he's already holding, and that Liliana is getting ready to ultimate, and we might see some zombie armies being assembled soon. Yeah, as it turns out, Liliana does not mind going back to basics, because her basic strategy involves summoning a Truly colossal amount of zombies. Yeah, pl planeswalkers are very good against mana denial strategies. And Anderson is actually not faced here with his uh, setup. It looks like all his cards have been doing so much more than, than what White has been up to. Colligan's command there coming from uh, Yanis. Once you can see there's a brainstorm on top of the deck, quite happy to let that one get cast when he knows that it'll be safe. So Predict, Terminus, and one more in there. Couldn't quite make out uh, revealed off the Brainstorm. Being able to put Terminus on top in principle kind of helpful, but when there's not the white mana to cast it and there's already a Liliana ultimate going on, Peter White electing to make discretion the better part of Valor, give himself a little bit more time for games two and three, and look to his sideboard to see what he can do in subsequent games. Each of these players as we pointed out at the start of the round, this is a win and in uh, match for them. The final round of the Swiss, if they can advance to 13 and 2, that will be good enough to advance to the elimination stages. We already have Peter van der Ham, uh, John de Groeter, Gregor Kowalski, and Gary Campbell, we believe, pretty much locked in uh, with the intentional draws that they took in the final round. They were the top four seeds, yeah, so they should so be fairly safe. Some of that is based on tiebreaker math. So 
for example, Gary Campbell is looking at um, a little below 70% uh, opponent match win percentage, and there are players with a with a similar opponent match win percentage that are trying to catch up to him. But it is very unlikely that uh, that they will be able to to do that. First, they will actually kick out Bernardo Santos and uh, Juha Ihonen, who drew on table three. Yeah, those guys with slightly lower opponent match win percentages. If anyone's going to lose out in the tiebreaker race, they seem more likely to be in that tough spot. Yeah, and uh, somebody like Peter White, uh, of course, a very impressive 12 and 2. He has only a 60% match win percentage, uh, full 10% less than some of the other players in his bracket. So you can see that he didn't really have a choice. He, he never even thought about IDing here. Probably, probably started off pretty badly uh, on day one, if I, if I wanted to guess. But at 36 points so far, if you can advance to 39, that absolutely rock solid safe will be in our top eight here. So step one for Peter White. Let's draw a good mix of lands and spells. Uh, we didn't quite see it in game one from him. He had those islands to work with. He had a tax and probe and a brainstorm. But without a shuffle effect, that brainstorm, if anything, just told him the numbing inevitability of what he had coming on in the, the next couple of turns as he put cards back that ultimately were just going to have to be redrawn. The dark side of brainstorm, and sometimes what you see that in, uh, in some of the limited environments where it's been reprinted, it's actually not so high a pick in, uh, in draft decks as you might think, considering what a powerhouse it has been in a lot of constructed formats. No, it's a it's actually not a highly desirable card at all in, in limited decks. You don't want to play it on turn one even, so when, do you, when are you actually happy to draw a Brainstorm? It's, it's not so often. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that characterizes these older formats, and particularly Legacy with likes of Brainstorm, is how cheaply and easily one is able to shuffle one's own library. And it's the shuffling and getting rid of the two cards that you put back f until some point later in the game that really pushes Brainstorm up into the very top tiers of what you can be doing for one blue manner in the format. Mm. Uh, these players are getting ready for game two. Uh, Anderson is already up a game with his uh, Grixis Kaz deck. Uh, that's Kaz Dissident Mage, of course. And to me, it looks like he has a really nice matchup against Miracles because most of his threats are actually not creatures that run into uh, Swords to Plowshares or Terminus. But instead, he's playing uh, Jaces, Lilianas, uh, and just a lot of ways to generate extra value, Belfold Strix, Colorgan's Command, and uh, Home to Tarek. So I, I think that Peter White has quite the, quite the challenge ahead of him. Now, for those of you perhaps not so familiar with Kess Dissident Mage, this is a creature that was originally printed in Commander, quite recently actually. Uh, one blue-black-red for a flying 3-4 legendary human wizard. And with flying, during each of your turns, you can cast an instant or sorcery from your graveyard if it would be cast that way, then exile it. So essentially, you get to flash back a spell each and every one of your turns. And that's a lot of value to sow into one creature. Yeah, this is basically a free Snapcaster trigger mm -hmm. each turn, including the one, uh, the turn in which you play it, if you have the mana, of course. In the meantime, though, our classic old Deathrite Shaman on the first turn of the game. Peter White at least now does have access to both of his colors of mana. And even though there's a wasteland in hand here for Yanis, there might be a temptation for Peter to fetch up basics. We already know that he's got back to basics, and a little bit of insurance against uh, wasteland potentially would not go amiss. And Anderson is a, a mana-hungry deck as well, and wants to resolve those three and four mana threats. We just mentioned Kess, which can even be useful if you have five or six mana available to you. So uh, Anderson is not the kind of wasteland deck like Grixis Delver. You can also tell from the fact that he's only running two. We might see a wasteland at an opportune moment uh, to, to stop Peter White from achieving what he wants to do, but it's not a part of Anderson's main game plan here. Now, one thing that Anderson does have available to him here, by using that uh, Shaman in order to make a little bit of extra mana, he can make the black black in order to cast him to Torak early doors. And this does meet a spell pierce here from Peter White. He doesn't want to be losing any of the cards in his hand just yet. Yeah, and that's uh, not really difficult. If there's a him to Torak on the stack and you have a chance to counter it, you usually go for it. Because discarding two cards at random is most likely much worse than uh, spending your counter spell. The Susan Van Camp version of him to Torak with the wolf on it 
One of the more popular Himta Torax around, four different artworks available for this particular Formula Empires card. But all from the same set? All from the same so set, So all yes. from the same printing, which is, well, is it's it the same printing? All, all from the same, yeah, all printed Print off run. the same sheet, yeah, yes. From the same printing. Uh, so you had the option, certainly with um, a, a whole bunch of the earlier sets, actually, Antiquities, Legends, and so on, uh, Arabian Nights, I believe, yes, uh, to have multiple different artworks of the same card. Just like the recent, most recent Unset. Yep, Unstable had versions that actually often had the same artwork, but slightly different rules text. Uh, this way round is a little bit easier to grok while you're playing uh, games, but these days, only having the one piece of artwork for each card in each set, I think probably does mean that people get to learn the card just a tiny bit faster. It's difficult enough for me to uh, memorize all these uh, masterpieces on, and alternate art versions, so kind of happy that we don't have four different artworks per, per card. And here's Counterbalance coming along from Peter White, a brainstorm in response from Yanis here. A resolved counterbalance always, always puts the fear into you that there might just be this string of spells getting countered uh, more or less randomly. Of course, it gets much worse once uh, your opponent also gets a way to manipulate the top of their library. Since his divining top is not legal anymore, but still, uh, getting, getting something like a Jace randomly countered is, is a disaster, although it's, of course, super unlikely. Uh, counterbalance for four might even be impossible in this... Uh, uh, in this miracle stack. Yeah, there we saw Peter White electing to simply cast days on the uh, on the Jace in play rather than on the Jace on the stack, sorry, rather than having to worry about what the top card of his deck was. Uh, the days 100% to work there. Counter target spell unless its controller plays one. Yes, it sets Peter White back an island because he returned an island to his hand to pay its cost, but I don't think he's going to mind too much. Even though Miracles is a deck that likes to play toward the late game. Sometimes you need to stop your opponent resolving a Planeswalker. Oh, absolutely. You don't want uh, to see Jace on the other side of the table ever, but especially not if you're playing Miracles. And with a Brainstorm in hand, that almost a virtual counter spell against a lot of things that uh, Anderson might be doing here. And we do see that Brainstorm deployed in response to Baleful Strix here. Having tapped out of most of his colored mana, the extent to which uh, Yanis can really punish Peter with a second spell after this uh, Baleful Strix. Kind of limited. No, this is kind of nice. Now the Miracles deck is really going here, and you see that Counterbalance is still a very potent card. Revealing Snapcaster Mage, that enough to counter Baleful Strix? There were thems that suggested that with the Banning of Sensei's Divining Top that Counterbalance was completely dead. Moribund maybe, but it's still fighting for this top eight here in Birmingham. No, yeah, this is very impressive. I was one of the, the players that thought that we would not see counterbalance again because uh, without Sensei's Divining Top, it just doesn't seem like such a powerful card. But if you play enough enough effects to make it work sometimes, and then you have the random hits as well, it's still just a, a great effect to have. So in response to Wasteland here, uh, Source to Plowshares on Deathrite Shaman, and in response to that, the Deathrite Shaman being activated, generating a mana, potentially going to sneak through a one-drop while the coast is clear, knowing that there's a two-cost spell on the top of the deck. Brainstorm does resolve. Now, Pyroblast drawn off the top there by Yanis in principle gives him a way of getting out of some kind of a counterbalance position because the Pyroblast does have the ability to destroy a blue permanent, though it must be said that one is one of the easier converted mana costs for Peter White to have on the top of his deck. Yeah, in, in this case, you, what you want to do is you want to bait the counterbalance uh, first with another spell, so for example with the Snapcaster Mage, and then if there is not a one on top, uh, then you go for the Pyroblast on the Counterbalance. Looking at this board, if, if the Counterbalance wasn't there, Anderson would be a huge favorite to win. But with the Counterbalance, this Miracles deck always has play. Portent means that Peter White gets to run a, a slow kind of a ponder, drawing, drawing a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep, having reset his deck order just a tiny bit and it's it's that same position we found ourselves in uh, in the last game a couple of islands in play but not too much else and this a great test spell in snapcaster mage threatening so many cards off the top predict here coming from peter white 
Yeah, Peter knew the top card of his deck. He knew that it uh, was a polluted delta, so um, it wouldn't have countered the Snapcaster Mage, and he wanted to draw two cards with uh, Predict. Yeah, an interesting little one from Odyssey there. It's amazing how deep a lot of these players have looked to find the potent card drawing cards available to Blue, especially those ones that you can play at instant speed. And Anderson has managed what we talked about, and it has to be Pyroblast now just to get the get the rewards. I mean, you can you can continue trying to outplay the counterbalance, but I would have just gotten rid of it. I guess the fact that you saw Jace the Mind Sculptor on top there means that having another card to fight over Jace with looks kind of tempting. Yes, but not having to fight through counterbalance at all time. Also, but what if what if uh, your opponent casts the Jace and and there is a one on top randomly? Then keeping that keeping that pyroblast is already negated by a random effect. All right, so here's a hymn to Torak. Reveals a three on top. That's not going to counter too terribly much. And Peter White still has the opportunity, even after the counterbalance trigger, to try and do something here. Cast a Vendillion click with Flash. Does not want to lose it to him to Torak. That is met with a Pyroblast. So it's being countered before it can influence any hands. Oh, no. That's... Okay. So... Anderson correctly countered the click and didn't destroy it with the trigger on the stack. That's that's good. Gets to have a few little hits in here with Snap Past Mage. By the way, my, my reasoning behind the Pyroblast was mainly that I don't think Jace is all that exciting on this board because you had two, uh, a two-creature advantage, Death Red Shaman and Snap Past Mage. You saw that your opponent didn't have four lands yet, and I think it would have been an easily fightable position to, to work from. You kind of want your Miracle's opponent to tap out and then to punish them for, for that. So Flooded Strand will give Peter White access to White Mana as and when he needs. Yanis, meanwhile, 15 damage left to deal in order to propel himself into the top eight here in Birmingham. The first of two top eights, because we do have standard going on tomorrow as well. Well, it's already going on now. Uh, players are battling in the final rounds of the standard event. And there is Kess Dissident Mage coming down now. With an extra mana up to protect. There is, there is the lucky Jace, right? You, you can counter you can counter Kess with counterbalance if you are, if you are fortunate enough. Quite a lot of spells in the graveyard that Kess is going to be able to uh, allow Yanis to take advantage of here if the game goes long enough with the legendary creature in play. And it's, it's one of the kind of entertaining things to me, the cards that have made their way straight into the legacy through some of these supplemental sets like Conspiracy, like the Commander sets. Uh, Duress here from Yanis, meeting a response from Peter White, cracks his fetch land in order to fetch up presumably a white source here and then hoping that things work out for the best off that counterbalance. Now, you can see that he's still going for basic, something that Miracle decks have always done. But in this matchup in particular, you, you do kind of want to stop Anderson from destroying your lands, uh, but also maybe there's still a, a back to basic in white deck. Ponder on the top there, meaning that Duress is countered by the Counterbalance Trigger. The good thing about the Counterbalance Trigger, because it's a triggered ability rather than a spell, you're not going to get a big counter war. Um, you can't counter the Counterbalance Trigger with most of the sorts of effects that you would typically counter as counter magic in your deck. That was a lot of counts, but you get the idea. <laughs> so Jace the Mind Sculpt comes down, Bounce and Kess. And if Jace can stay in play for any length of time, that will mean that setting up the top card is a lot easier for Peter White, thanks to the zero ability of Brainstorm each and every turn. 
And this is now this is now the crucial turn. What is what is on top of Peter's library? Casting Kess again. Kess seems like one of the cards most likely to be able to resolve through a counterbalance. I can't imagine there being too terribly many four drops in Peter White's deck. One no, of them in play, of course. It's almost guaranteed to to resolve. Um, I, I believe it's only the second uh, the second Jace in Peter's deck, and Peter might not even show the card on top to not let Anderson know which of his instants or sorceries from the graveyard would resolve here. So him to Torak gets cast, revealing a land on top, and exactly two cards in hand, Detention Sphere and Ponder, going to the graveyard, clear path, Deathrite Shaman decides that he wants to rumble with Jace, takes that loyalty down to just a single point. And Peter White drawing a little thin here, kind of having to use the brainstorm ability of Jace just to get something going, that meaning that the Mind Sculptor likely to be exposed to being killed off on attacks this very next turn. But a huge brainstorm here with uh, Swords to Plowshares in the top three. So suddenly Peter seems to be back in this game and I, I like his I like his board if he manages to prevent Deathrite Shaman from, from killing his Jays. I, I believe that he has a brainstorm in hand which is yeah, he's electing not to use it there, but he may find that he wants to use it at some point to at least try and get a counter here on the spells being cast on the other side of things. He's Gataxian Probe, Land, and Monastery Mentor. A three, a one, and a zero. None of them are going to stop a Baleful Strix costing two. This has been a rough old uh, series of uh, games for Peter White here. Yeah. Not quite able to string everything together he might want. Already facing a matchup that's not great to play and then also his deck looking a bit anemic he, he never really got anything going anything impressive going it looked like there might there might have been a chance at a comeback had the jay sticked around stuck around still de debating also from anderson's side the the use of mana pyroblasts which, which spells to flashback when you have a case in play. Uh, really, really difficult decision trees, uh, especially, I think, for the Grixis player, who, who is uh, playing a deck that, that does take uh, quite a bit out of you. You have to play a long game almost every round. Yeah, and we can see here that they're in game two, a little over 20 mi 22 minutes left on the round. If I'm Yanis, I'm not too worried about that, but something that Miracles players have had to tussle with for pretty much the entire history of the deck is making sure that they can win rounds on time. Yeah, now that Census Divining Top is banned, that's a lot less of a concern, though. That was the main culprit, the main problem uh, with uh, getting rounds done in time. So, Gitaxin Probe there, both revealing Snapcaster Mage and Red Elemental Blast in Yana Skofi Anderson's hand, additionally generating a Monk token, drawing a card for Peter White, doing it all in many respects. Um, one of the good things about Monastery Mentor, back from the days of Miracles being arguably the best deck in Legacy, is the fact that there were a lot of Pyroblasts, Red Elemental Blasts running around, and it's a threat that being white couldn't be dealt with with what was at one point a very, very common piece of counter spell slash removal. Um, these days, the removal stacks up a little bit differently. Fatal Push at least if you've got Revolt Triggered, will always kill a Monastery Mentor. Um, Swords to Plowshares, we don't see quite so much of that these days, though not impossible to imagine a Monastery Mentor growing past a Lightning Bolt. Yeah, but, but now this Mentor is already threatening to take over the game, and as we all know, it doesn't take too long uh, for that to happen. Back to Basics, one of the cards on top of Peter White's deck. Already a mountain and an island, sorry, a, a swamp and an island in play for Yanis here. But he does have a lot of non-basics there. If he chooses to tap down low, it may be tempting to try and catch things out a little bit with back-to-basics here. Yanis, happy enough to eat spells from Peter White's graveyard. There is the likelihood of Snapcaster Mage at some point, which means that getting them out of his opponent's graveyard, an attractive prospect. And here comes a duress. Brainstorm in response. That'll create a monk. 
There's nothing left to find right now. Lightning Bolt in response to kill off the uh, Monastery Mentor. I like that play. Yeah, and uh, Anderson has shown that he's not scared of counterbalance. He would, would much rather have Peter White have the random uh, counterbalance triggers and fight against his spells. But did Peter now forget one of his uh, monk triggers or is it still arriving? Because the I think that Peter announced something. I, I, it looked like he announced uh, that he was, he was triggering the monk. Difficult to tell when you can't can't hear what's going on. Yeah, Peter White here. No cards in hand, living off the top of his deck in a variety of different ways, partly due to the fact he's got no cards in hand, partly due to the fact that counterbalance is such a big part of his game plan right now. So it looks like the monk token was indeed missed. So here's back to basics off the top. Those three non-basic lands already tapped for Yanis Anderson. Not going to be untapping anytime soon. And two monk tokens trading off for two copies of Baleful Strix. Who's going to be happier about that exchange? Huh. I think Peter is very happy with how things have been going. And also Anderson um, somehow tapping all his, uh, his non-basics there. Of course, not really knowing what to expect. But if you're a psychic, you can... You can uh, prioritize using your basics. Um, Anderson maybe not uh, playing around back to basics there. Quite a few lands still in the graveyard, I believe, uh, and it's still a Bloodstained Mire and a Scalding Tarn in play, meaning that that Deathright Shaman can definitely help on the mana front uh, for Yanis here. I don't think back to basics is uh, the end of the world for Anderson. He has an active Deathright, he's draining Peter for two each turn, there is a counterbalance, that's the, the one trump that Peter has, but he needs something big, he needs a Jace or, or something to, to actually do something relevant on this board. Maybe another mentor would be good. Yeah, I mean, Yanis here, one way of getting around counterbalance, just don't cast any spells. You've got your little one-mana Planeswalker in play doing his thing. Here's another Monastery Mentor, but at least at present, no follow-up, and Deathrite Shaman can definitely race a Monastery Mentor if it's got to deal a full 20. Yeah, especially if, uh, if the score is 20 to 4 and Peter needs to draw some spells first to even trigger it. I think Anderson is clinching a top 8 here in the next two turns. Lots of spells in that graveyard. Even if it worked out that somehow or other Peter managed to get rid of all the cards in his yard, plenty of food for Deathrite Shaman and no need for uh, Yanis to push the tempo here any more than he already has. Another copy of Monastery Mentor, I believe, off the top there. And that enough for the handshake. Yanis Scobby Anderson, you can see there what this means to him. Locking up a top eight with his Grixis Kess deck. Congratulations to him. 2-0. A little bit of time for him to just get a bit of rest, center himself a little bit, because he's got up to three more matches of Magic to play here on Saturday at Grand Prix Birmingham. This is the legacy part of our Grand Prix series here at Birmingham. We have got a standard Grand Prix going on at the same time. As of tomorrow, we will be bringing you all the hottest tech from standard. Do not worry, our text reports have been going around finding out everything that's been going on from a standard state of mind, which we'll be able to bring you tomorrow. But for, day, it's all, for today, it's all about legacy. We've already had a lot of good matches, and we believe that we now have five players locking up their top eight slot. That means that we still have a little bit more magic to show you to potentially clear things up and get our full top eight before we go to our elimination stages. I'm going to be interested to see exactly how that breaks down. We've seen a lot of success for variations on Brainstorm Control decks, be they Grixis, be they uh, more uh, four-color Leovold decks. A lot of different options there. And even though, in principle, they're doing the same things with the power of Brainstorm and so on, some of them much more at the control end of the mm -hmm. spectrum. Some of them can afford to be a little bit more aggro. And I know that we have at least one... Uh, mono red prison deck that's looking to shake things up in the hands of Gary Campbell from Scot Scotland. We'll get a chance to see more magic, more people potentially locking up their top eight spots very soon. Do not go anywhere. More magic after these messages.
Hello and welcome back to coverage of Grand Prix Birmingham. I'm Tim Willoughby, this is Simon Gertsen and there's not very much magic left before we hit our top eight now. We have five presumptive members of our top eight. We know that there's been a few intentional draws, some of which are, appear to be better ideas than others based on the way that the tiebreakers look right now. But that means that there's also a few matches still going that can determine who is going to be playing in our top eight. Let's head back down to our feature match area to see one of them. And we get a chance to see Alexander Mertens on the left of our screen against Grant Fishman. Each of these players on that 12-2 record where a win means that they will be in this top eight. And a Cephalid Coliseum followed by a careful study could it be some sort of graveyard shenanigans going on here? I think it might be. So Alexander Mertens playing a deck that I personally have not seen on camera all weekend, that being Dredge. Golgari Graves, Grave Trolls, Golgari Thugs, Stinkweed Imps, all of that good stuff. In Legacy, you even get to do things like casting Lion's Eye Diamond and Breakthrough to get cards into your graveyard. This is a very powerful deck indeed that already has a uh, Golgari Grave Troll in the graveyard, a Cephalid Colosseum in play next turn could be wildly explosive for Alexander Mertens. Yeah, and we, we really haven't seen Dredge all weekend, and now Grand Fishman on the draw, even with a Deathrite Shaman, is looking at a, at a dredged Golgari Grifto. This could be another super fast game if, if Mertens just has a breakthrough in hand, he might be going for the kill on turn two. All right, so a big turn here. Dredge six cards. Faithless Looting, there's Nicarid, Stinkweed Imp, Bridge from Below number one, Street Wraith, Mana Confluence here. Not a great dredge, but at least there was a Stinkweed Imp in there, so you, you can continue the chain, making it so much more likely that you will go, um, like you will never stop dredging, which is the, the main goal of, of this deck. And with Cephalid Colosseum in play, worth noting that we are already at Threshold. And now there is a second Coliseum, so Mertens has the mana to activate it. Might even go for it right here, unless he has a, a blue spell that's better suited. How's Breakthrough look for you? How crazy is this card? It's just a single blue draw four. For Dredge, at least. Yeah, Breakthrough. With, up, with upside. Draw four cards, uh, then choose X cards in your hand and discard the rest. In this instance, you don't care about the cards in your hand, you want them in your graveyard. All of a sudden, we've got uh, a whole mess of extra cards in the graveyard here for Alexander Mertens. But Mertens failed to find another dredger. It was a, it was a close call. He also didn't find an Alchemiba. So this game is not over. Uh, Mertens has now uh, the ability to slow dredge. And if his land stays in play, he will also get to activate um, Cephalic Coliseum. Had to discard a Nakamiba there rather than dredging it. That a little sad because he does have Cabal Therapy in the graveyard, which would have been fantastic alongside the various copies of Bridge from Below that he's got working for him here. A lot of targets for that uh, Deathrite Shaman all of a sudden. Too many, uh, most likely. Uh, no black mana available just yet to take spells from that graveyard. Uh, it's not too relevant, though. You, you, what you want to be doing right now is... You want to stop the dredging, but if there are multiple dredgers, it's not like uh, Mertens has to announce which card he wants to dredge with. It's just a replacement effect. So, um, yeah, th this is actually probably the best thing he can do. Wastelanding the Colosseum s gives him or, or denies three draws off of Mertens. So three draws, that's three dredges. So Icarid from Torment. This is one of those cards that was in some of the very first iterations of the dredge list. The 3-1 that gets to come back from the graveyard simply by eating another creature in that graveyard. And alongside Cabal Therapy, you can do some pretty naughty stuff. And once you add Bridge from Below to the mix, you're generating zombies by sacrificing creatures. It gets very powerful indeed. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to um, recite the full text of Bridge from Below, but for now what's, what's relevant is that uh, because it's in the graveyard, when non-token creatures die on Martin's side, he will get zombie tokens out of the deal. And that's an important part of the combo uh, that Dredge is trying to assemble, usually built around um, Dread Return. Now, looking at the list that Alexander Mertens is working for here, it doesn't look to be quite as all-in on the one big turn type combo, at least in game one. Um, 
as some lists are, more of a kind of slow dredge in some respects, just generating lots of zombies, getting rid of cards in opposing hands. And here we see that playing out a little bit. Uh, Icarids coming into play, exiling Street Wraith. Street Wraith not really overly important when it's in the graveyard there. Three Icarids in total uh, coming into play in upkeep. Yeah, interesting. The um, main deck of Alexander Maritimes is really not focused on Dread Return at all. You are just trying to generate a lot of zombies by sacrificing your Narcomivas and uh, Icarids. After sideboarding, certainly an option available to start using Dread Return on, uh, ash on uh, big creatures to just get stuck in in a big way. But for now, kind of doing it the old-fashioned way in some respects. So we have the classic battle here of um, Icarid versus Deathrite Shaman or Dredge in general against Deathrite Shaman. The, the fear of Deathrite Shaman just basically blanking your whole game plan is certainly real. So, so Dredge, I think there's a reason why we haven't seen a lot of it this weekend. So a Cabal Therapy initially generating two zombies due to two copies of Bridge from Below in uh, Alexander Merton's graveyard here. And the first Cabal Therapy, I mean, the cards that you name as a dredge player, not even necessarily quite the same as everyone else, especially given that you're not planning on trying to resolve a, uh, a dread return, it's, it's more about cards that can disrupt the graveyard. And in some respects, the main effect of this Cabal Therapy is just generating a lot of zombies. That's the main idea, yeah. And uh, Martins maybe was just checking if, if Fishman had a brainstorm to find uh, possible answers or more wastelands that could put Mertens in trouble. What Mertens definitely wants to prevent is one of Fishman's Deathrite Shamans entering, uh, going to the graveyard. And that might sound weird because Deathrite Shaman is clearly powerful in this matchup, but um, if one of Fishman's creatures die, then the, all the bridges that are currently in Mertens' graveyard uh, get exiled. So. Bridge from Below, probably one of the most obscure, most complex cards. Uh, if you haven't played with it uh, yet, then I think it's very understandable that it can be a bit confusing. Well, I mean, it's an enchantment that if you're looking at cards with the correlation of their being cast and winning the game, might have amongst the lowest of any card in Magic because you never want to cast it, you want it in your graveyard. I have to talk to Mark Rosewater one day and just ask him why it has a casting cost of black, black, black. Why does it have a casting cost at all? It's, it's, if you cast it, you're doing yourself a disservice. Oh, creatures before graveyards? Yeah, typically when you have a, a normal, quote unquote, uh, magic deck, your graveyard will be somewhere alongside your uh, library. Because the graveyard is such an important feature, specifically of the dredge deck, often uh, you'll see graveyards placed in a slightly different location. Uh, and it looks like we're just trying to make sure that there's clear delineation of a creature zone, a land zone, and a graveyard. I'm just happy that dredge doesn't play Dryad Arbor. <laughs> Dryad Arbor the culprit for a fair amount of confusion in terms of where creatures sit versus where lands sit, because it is both at all times. Okay, we figured out a way. One card in hand for Alexander Mertens as well, for what it's worth. And here comes a ponder from Grant Fixman. Fishman who conspicuously not playing Merfolk at this event. But does, does Fishman have any outs here? It's not like he, he's playing Pyroclasm in the main deck or anything like that. I mean, does he have a Lightning Bolt to kill one of his own... Uh, he does, but... Deathrite Shaman. There are six zombies on the, on the opposing side of the battlefield, so I think Lightning bolt Bolting your own creatures is, is not going to help you. Too little, too and, late, maybe. And these Icarids are also coming back. Or most of them will. Yeah, I mean, really here in game one, we've seen the potency of not giving your opponent spells to counter and just generating lots of zombies while simultaneously casting these Cabal Therapies, which is pretty inefficient to try and counter in the first place. And that's why Mertens is not even bothering with dread returning anything. He doesn't have to have this combo kill. 
in game one, there's almost no deck that's set up to, to deal with this uh, swarm of zombies anyway. Icarids coming back again. Not too much food left for some of these Icarids. There's a Stinkweed Imp still hanging around. And I guess that it may be that it reaches a point where Alexander Mertens doesn't really mind just uh, drawing cards rather than anything else. He still has a Golgari Grave Troll to dredge here, so six more cards into the graveyard. That Narcomiva will hit play. No more therapies, though. I think we will just see Mertens go on offense here. If his, if his bridges go, go to exile now, I think he's still winning easily in, in the next two turns. He knows most of what Grant Fitchman has going on here and is going to be able to make some big attacks. You know what, Simon? I'm not going to be sad if we end up with a dredge deck in our top eight here. I like a little bit of variety. I think it really helps characterize what Legacy is all about, that there are a multitude of very, very power op powerful options if you decide that you want to be uh, playing this format. But as things stand here, Alexander electing not to attack that turn, just letting his Icarids die at the end of turn, meaning four more zombie tokens. There might, there might even be a, a case of underestimating Dredge because you know it's a, that Legacy is currently a Death by Charmin uh, world then you might just think, oh, who's going to bring Dredge? With Death Red Charm, we have the perfect answer in our main decks already. But as you can see here, on the draw, Death Red Charm was just far too slow to even matter. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that going for the approach that, which I would cons uh, consider more typical of Dredge, of we've got this Dread return, we're going to cast it, it's going to be huge, we're going to end the game on turn one or two. Taking this slightly slower approach may just be a better plan because it, it really doesn't afford the control deck anything to grab a hold of. Yeah, it looks like you're playing somehow the most consistent Game 1 deck or Game 1 version of Dredge without really giving up anything because um, Dredge Return just gives you these sorceries that might be countered, uh, gives you an issue against Death Red Shaman's black activated ability, a bunch of bunch of things which you just don't have to care about in game one when you're playing one of the best game one decks in the format anyway. So here we see one Narc Amoeba and a whole host of zombies coming in. Grant Fishman, I think he can survive this attack, but he's not going to be on very much life total after that takes place. He's still hoping for a miracle though. Terminus maybe. The Terminus is the miracle that we all hope for. Gets a value double block here, maybe. Bridge from Below's do get eaten up when Deathrite Shaman dies. And they're also choosing to eat a few spells here, given that they can. On the way out. Alexander Mertens not at one life here, nor indeed is Grant Fishman at 12. We might need to just get that uh, adjusted somewhat. Suffice to say, there we go. Fishman on the brink. Never give up, never surrender. Until it's time to give up, which might be exactly now. Well, I think it was time a few turns ago, but... We don't mind seeing a little bit of extra magic here. We're in time walk phase. We are getting to see as much magic as we can before we get to our actual top eight announcement. We'll be bringing you that just as soon as we're able to. And in the meantime, these guys are going to be going on to the game too. And via the magic of time walk, we don't even need to worry about the shuffling and the mulliganing. We go straight in with game two. Mana Confluence, the, the land on turn one from uh, Alexander Mertens here. That's a silent gravestone. Not Grafstone, but Gravestone. It's interesting. Our text reporter, Toby Henker, was saying that the fact that this is actually a Gravestone rather than a Grafstone has really messed with his finger's ability to spell cards because he's so used to typing Grafstone for various different things. And it means that cards in graveyards can't be the target of spells or abilities. In some respects, it normally count, you normally look at it as a graveyard hate card. Actually, it makes life a lot easier for this particular graveyard deck in terms of keeping its cards safe. It's a foil, it's a foil for Deathrite Shaman. 
uh, most importantly. So in the early stages of this game, Grant Fishman having the answers to a lot of what Alexander Mertens has going on, he's not been able to resolve his first couple of spells and that could prove very important because just those early enablers really make a big difference to the overall uh, potency of this dredge list. Yeah, and being, being on the play here, once again, making a huge difference. Just having the dace available, for example. Uh, otherwise, Mertens would have started off uh, much stronger. Now, I like Firestorm quite a bit in Alexander Merton's hand here. Uh, the big card from Weatherlight. We've seen a few interesting cards from Weatherlight over the course of this weekend. But Firestorm, it's, it allows you to discard cards as an additional cost. So you, as an additional cost, discard X cards and it deals X damage to X targets. So a nice bit of crowd control against the creatures that Grant Fishman has in play. But more crucially, an uncounterable way of getting cards into that graveyard. Yeah, really cool card. And... Actually, I don't think we've seen many weather red, weather red cards, right? Uh, veteran Explorer. Okay. Uh, it was a little while ago at the start of the day. We did get a chance to see that one in play. At least from uh, from Mirage, Mirage Visions Weatherlight, the, the block definitely has had quite the impact on Legacy. Lion's Eye Diamond, of course, in the dredge deck from Mirage. Natural Order in Visions, a pretty big deal. Yeah. Entirely fair, magic cards. <laughs> so these guys just figure out where they want to be from here. Looks like we've got a surgical extraction in hand for Grant Fishman here. That a nice answer to a lot of what the dredge deck is aiming to achieve. Silent Gravestone also disabling surgical extraction because it is a targeted effect. I like this. I like this uh, Silent Gravestone technology. Yeah, it feels to me like Alexander Mertens, he's, he's really thought about what the dredge deck can do and indeed wants to do because this is not the kind of build that if you had told me, oh, I want to play, play dredge at the Legacy GP, what should my 75 look like in what configuration, I don't think I would have got close to this build. No, because you always start with the question, what do I want to dread return, right? You never start with the question, should I play the dread return in the main deck? Three firestorms, by the way. So really... Uh, the knowledge that you need to be able to empty your hand against certain decks, especially when they have a lot of counter magic. And okay. if you're Grant Fishman here, you can afford to be a little bit cagey for a while, uh, get your hits in with the creatures that you have in play where appropriate, and then just sort of sit back knowing that now you actually have positive interaction. In game one, that counter magic not so many things that it can achieve, but right now, right here, Firestorm, yes, it's going to potentially kill some of your creatures if you allow it to resolve, but it's also going to put cards in the graveyard that potentially can be great targets for this Surgical Extraction. But Merchants now has, Merchants has to discard these cards as an additional cost. That's important, an important detail. So the fact that there's two different dredges being discarded, Golgari Grave Troll and Golgari Thug, means that there's not going to be the sort of the perfect storm of everything getting removed from the graveyard in addition to countering that firestorm. Countering the firestorm seems pretty solid. It means that there's uh, a reasonable clock being applied by Grant Fishman here. And you're still going to exile the, the Grave Trolls, right? You're not, you don't want your opponents dredging for six. You get a token out of the deal. And then Merton slow dredging, slow dredging or Gary Thugs. Are you really losing to that? I, I don't think so. Now, Grant Fishman does get the opportunity to have a brief look through the post-sideboard configuration of Dredge that's being applied by uh, Alexander Mertens here. So he gets to see exactly what he needs to be afraid of. Does he need to hold back uh, Counter Magic for Dread Return? It does not appear so. No, and he knows, he knows uh, in particular about the number of Silent Gravestones. So we might even see him bring Ancient Grudge or Abrupt Decay to... No, I, no, he can't cast Abrupt Decay, I believe. He doesn't have it. But, uh, for example, Ancient Grudge or something like uh, something similar to deal with a gra Gravestone. Yeah, Alexander Mertens, when you sign up to play Dredge, one sort of universal truth is your game one is very different from your games two and three. Game one, if you find yourself disrupted more than a little bit, quite frankly, that's a little unusual. Um, game two, if you don't find yourself a little disrupted... Well, it, it That's highly unusual. It's highly unusual, but also brilliant. You just win the game. Uh, 
Uh, I think that dredge undisrupted is one of the most potent things that you can be doing. Nakamiba getting dredged into play, but not a whole host else for Alexander Mertens here. Stinkweed Dimp in the graveyard, so at least that dredge chain will keep on a running. Stinkweed Dimp, the next best dredger after Golgari Grave Troll. Mm, two lands, but a Deathrite Shaman for Fishman. Maybe that's already enough to lock out the game here. Yeah, I like I like keeping Deathrite Shaman on top. Oh, no, no green mana, though. Oh, but the fetch line on top should, should actually solve that. So, yeah, this game looks not quite as one-sided as game one, but uh, quite clear that Grixis Delver is winning here. Alexander Martins gradually accumulating a handful of dredgers as he dredges back still more cards. Gets a Nakamiba again. One, two, three, four, five cards. Again, he's, he's managed to find himself one more dredger each time. And not so exciting allowing these Icarids to come into play here. It does cost you a black card in your graveyard. And right now, the Icarids don't even get to get sacrificed for any positive effect with Bridge from Below. They don't get to be used with uh, Cabal Therapy. You might as well just leave them in the graveyard and hope that that's going to be good enough. Did he just dredge uh, Stinkweed Imp? He dredged a Stinkweed Imp to his hand, yes. Yeah, so I think he missed the Monarch Remiva trigger right there. So, uh, Alexander Martins, he's got to hope for something relatively big here, and I'm not quite sure what that is. It's going to be a dredge into... I mean, if he dredged, say, that Golgari Thug into three Bridge from Belows and a Cabal Therapy, is that good? Uh, with the Nakamiba in play, yeah, that's good. It, I, don't, I got still Icarids don't think to work with. I still don't think it's enough. Uh, you know, he's he's losing on board. He's losing the race. Uh, there is an active Death Rite Shaman now, and uh, it, does he even have dredgers left? Like, I think. I think it's just over now. If you start, if you start drawing from the top of your deck, that's really the sign that things have not worked out for you. I mean, I like. I guess that if he drew a Cephalid Colosseum, he does have threshold, so he could activate it and potentially set himself up for future turns. But he's on ten life. It's not as if he's got infinite time to work with here. That's true. Uh, Cephalid Colosseum would be like the top deck of dreams, but. I mean, breakthrough would be all right. But if you don't have a dredger in your graveyard at that moment, it's actually not as strong as, as it would be otherwise. Get some hits in where you can here. Alexander Mertens, it may be that he has to wait until game three. Now, worth noting, of course, that on the play in game three, he could potentially get a lot going before Grant Fishman has anything going on. So it's, it's certainly not all over for Mertens here as he casts a Golgari Thug. Yeah. You have to do what you have to do. Taking two damage in the process as well. Surgical Extraction revealed to transform a Delver of Secrets, and that's enough for Alex under Mertens to Somebody pick up his cards. Somebody stop this Rebuys, we're trying again. It's game three. This time around, it's Alexander Mertens on the play, and he kicks things off with a Lion's Eye Diamond. Five cards for Fishman. Three cards for Fishman, yeah. sorry has to play a Force of Will on Lion's Eye Diamond as his first play of the game. And that really, you know, showing respect for how powerful the, the big rare from Mirage is. In this particular deck, it can just achieve a crazy amount. A second copy of Lion's Eye Diamond. This could be gigantic for Alexander Mertens here. Wow, that's huge. Imagine if he has a breakthrough now. No, not a breakthrough, but if he has a... Uh, uh, faithless looting now. Yeah, he discards his entire hand. He does have a faithless looting. Red, red, red off that Lion's Eye Diamond. He immediately gets to dredge a Golgari Grave Stroll. He's also got a Golgari Thug and a Bridge from Below in the graveyard. This is impressive. Turn one. Opponent on three cards. Zero lands in play. The second dredge will be a Golgari Thug. So a few more cards in the graveyard here. His opponent had a Force of Will. Yeah, for one Lion's Eye Diamond. Another copy of uh, Golgari Grave Troll going into the graveyard. Faithless Looting has resolved. Now can we best enter the battlefield? Oh, if you're Grant Fishman right now, this has to be a painful, painful moment. After winning game two in such decisive fashion, just a hammer blow to him on this very first turn of game three in our, our match that will ultimately decide one of our members of our top eight here. And you are, then you are, of course, questioning your choices 
in this particular game? Was it was it right to mulligan aggressively? Was it right to uh, force a will that lions high diamond? Given what you knew, given what you could expect, and uh, it ba backfiring so badly is uh, really tough to watch. I mean, personally, I feel like Grant made the correct choices. He just found himself on the wrong end of an absolutely monster draw here from Alexander Mertens. I agree. That's what it. That's what it feels like. It's still. It's still a tough pill to swallow, though. So here come the first set of attacks. There's a cu at least one copy of Bridge from Below in the graveyard there. Easy to get mixed up with Street Wraith. Uh, but when that Icarid dies, we'll see just based on the number of zombies that come into play here for Alexander Mertens. Yeah, it's, uh, I believe it's two bridges and one, st uh, one Street Wraith in the graveyard. Ah, yes. Two of them on that kind of bottom row of the graveyard there. No uh, Cabal Therapies, at least. Otherwise, Fishman would sit there with no hand and an army of zombies on the other side. Rough, rough game here for Grant Fishman. He's going to have to find something big if he's going to get back in this one. I'm not even quite sure what that will be in this game three. You wanted to see Dredge in the top eight, Tim. That's what you get. Wow, I get everything I want now. This is a, I'm having the best day. I want a boat. Can I have a boat? Well, f first you get Dredge in the top eight, and then... Then we'll see. <laughs> then we'll see. What else you deserve. Very well. Grant Fishman, you can tell just from his body language here that this is going to be a, a rough old ask for him in these uh, these next few turns if he's going to find a way back in this game. Merton's playing around Wasteland skillfully. Yeah, never once playing a land this game. Who needs it? No cards in hand, no lands in play, but you know what, no problem. They are still still resolving this brainstorm, Fishman deciding what to keep. Is that a Cabal Therapy still in uh, Grant Fishman's deck that he's putting on the back top of his deck? Fishman? Yeah, he has he has Cabal Therapy if he didn't board them out. Maybe, maybe for just to, yeah, maybe just to catch a... A discard spell or or a breakthrough uh, on on one of the earlier turns of the game. It's not not completely impossible. As things stand here, two Icarids coming into play. Then we've got a dredge of good Eric Drave Troll. Four, uh, six more cards going to the graveyard here. Another bridge from below, and there's a Cabal Therapy. First up, let's do some swings and then do some mass. Three, six, eight, ten, twelve damage coming through here. That's enough for the handshake. Alexander Mertens winning his time walk match, and that will be enough to secure him, we believe, a spot in the top eight. I say we believe. This is a little bit of a, a, a misspeak on my part because I have actually been handed a full set of final standings here from the Swiss stages of the tournament here at Grand Prix Birmingham Legacy Edition. So with that, I get a chance to inform you of the full top eight that we will be featuring in mere moments. The players just filling in forms, taking photos and that sort of thing. So in number one seed, we do have Peter van der Ham. We kind of knew that one. He had taken an intentional draw in the last round. 41 points. Fantastic performance from him. In second place, Johan de Gruyter. 40 points. Very solid. He was in the top eight. We knew about that one. In third place, that's Alexander Mertens. We just saw him winning his match there, going up to 39 from 36 completely solid. Uh, Janis Anderson, we saw him locking up 39 points also. And then there comes the sweat. So six players finished on 37 points, of which only four could be in the top eight. And we know that there was that intentional draw on table three that we believed might have ended up being problematic for at least one of those two players. So in uh, fifth place, we had uh, Gregor Kowalski, sixth, Gary Campbell. We knew that as the numbers three and four seed, they were fairly safe. So it's these last two spots that are the real sweat. In seventh place, we had Bernardo Santos. So that was one of our players that took the intentional draw on table, the gamble, table three. Took the gamble. It paid off for him. 67-point match win percentage, enough to hit it, the top eight in seventh place. In eighth place, though, Yuta Takahashi. Takahashi-san, he was one of the players playing in this last round, got up to uh, uh, 37 points and ultimately pushed Yuha Ihonen into ninth place. So that intentional draw for Ihonen 
did not quite work out. Finally, we had Jesper Christensen, 37 points. Fantastic finish for him, but unfortunately, just 10th place. So he will not be playing in our final elimination stages here on Saturday in Birmingham for our Legacy Grand Prix. That is our top eight. Do not go anywhere because we will have our match play soon enough after these messages.